Great. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Veronica for inviting me and also all of you for coming and giving me the opportunity to talk about um, some stuff that I'm super excited about. Um, uh, developments over the last 20, 25 years in theoretical physics that are totally mind-blowing, in, in my opinion, sub my subjective opinion, granted, um, uh, and um, uh, that have to do with the connection, with connections between quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, I decided to give a Blackboard talk, um, uh, not out of laziness, uh, I did actually prepare a PowerPoint talk, and then yesterday I decided it would be more fun to just do it on the Blackboard. Uh, so we'll have to see how that goes. But the idea is maybe to um, uh, hopefully encourage um, interaction in the sense of, you know, that, that you should feel absolutely free, um, indeed obligated to, uh, to stop me when there's something you don't understand and to ask questions and so on. So don't, you don't have to wait for the end to ask questions. I'm sure there, will, there are things that I'll say that, you know, I'm, that I don't say very well, that I say in a confusing way, and so um, please, please uh, feel free to stop me. Um, so um, uh, I put this uh, website on, on the board um, in case, if, if you're interested in what I'm talking about today, I, I wrote up um, uh, a sort of semi-popular level um, uh, introduction to this stuff. Um, we, you know, it's not written for people in the field, it's written for non-experts. Um, uh, and so if you want to see basically the written version of this talk, that's, you know, someplace you can go. Okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, so um, uh, I'm going to start with quantum mechanics. Oh, one other thing is that um, if my... Um, yeah, is this legible from the back of the room? Okay, all right. So if that's if that stops being the case, then you know, obviously, let me know. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about the theme is uh, this connection, unexpected, um, that we still do not understand between quantum mechanics and gravity. And uh, so I want to start um, by putting a spotlight on two uh, problems that are hard because of quantum mechanics. I think John set me up well in the sense of emphasizing that quantum mechanics just leads to a level of computational difficulty that you don't find in classical mechanics or in classical, you know, um, uh, yeah, in, 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 in classical physics. And, um, of course, there are many differences between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics that, that we could name, and one of them is entanglement, which I'll get back to. But let me start with something which is even sort of more elementary, which is one of the first things you learn, um, you know, even in high school about quantum mechanics, which is Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, so um, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, as I'm sure you know, uh, tells you that um, if you have a particle in, in quantum mechanics, then um, you, uh, even if you have as much information as you could have about the state of that particle, that information will be encoded in a wave function, unlike in classical mechanics, where you know at any given time the particle has a certain position and certain momentum. And in quantum mechanics, it doesn't. It has a wave function, and that wave function is spread out over space at least a little bit. Uh, so you have some uncertainty in the position, of course. And similarly, you have an uncertainty in the momentum, and these are bounded. Uh, so you can try to make one of them smaller, but then the other one will be larger, and so on. And uh, they're bounded by Planck's constant. Okay, so um, uh, what I want to say, so I assume this is not, not news um, uh, to you guys, but uh, what's not so well known is that um, this uncertainty principle applies uh, outside of um, just positions and momenta. Um, and it applies to some observable quantities that, you, that might be a little bit surprising at first. So the first hard problem I, I want to talk about has to do with uh, uncertainty in actually the number of particles in some system. So if we start uh, with an easy case, which is just, let's say, a hydrogen atom. Uh, so let me ask you guys, what is a hydrogen atom made of? Proton and electron. So a hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron, but actually, 
the, if you actually measure the number of electrons in a hydrogen atom, uh, you'll get one most of the time, but there's a small amplitude, a small probability that you would actually get uh, a couple of electrons. But of course, the charge is conserved, so in that case, there would be a proton there, too. And this, this is, uh, um, the probability for that is very small, and there's even a smaller probability for getting, you know, three electrons and two positrons and so on. So actually, the number of electrons in a hydrogen atom is subject to the uncertainty principle as well. It is not definite. Uh, and we know how to, we have theories basically developed by Feynman and friends, you know, a long time ago uh, that allow us to calculate all of this and understand what's going on for a hydrogen atom. Uh, now, let me give you a harder question, which is, let's talk about the proton. Um, uh, what's a proton made of? Maybe raise hands. Oh. I heard three quarks. Uh, okay, so a proton um, uh, is made of three quarks, and those are uh, happen to be two up quarks and a down quark. Um, so I'm sure you've heard that. And so I just want to tell you, this is just completely bogus. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, um, because the interactions uh, of the particles inside a proton are way, way, way stronger than the ones between the proton and the electron in a hydrogen atom the fluctuations, the uncertainty in the number of particles and even the types of particles is way, way stronger inside a proton. So actually, a proton is a complete messy soup of uh, many different kinds of quarks, not just up and down, but also, um, uh, you know, strange quarks and so on, and gluons. So gluons are the particles like photons that, that um, uh, like the name suggests, that glue the uh, quarks together inside of a proton or a neutron or whatever, and there is actually a total mess of all of that stuff, all different numbers of them, all different species of them uh, inside of a proton. It is, and so these number fluctuations uh, make a proton really, really, really hard to analyze. Now, in this particular case, um, uh, <clears throat> we have a theory which we have excellent reason to believe uh, is, is correct for describing the constituents of a proton or any kind of nucleus, any kind of nuclear matter. And that, uh, that theory uh, is called QCD, uh, quantum chromodynamics, the important thing for our purposes being the Q, the quantum part. Uh, and so it, this is a case where we have the equations, but the equations are incredibly, incredibly hard to solve, much in the way that John was talking about to simulate you know, 300 qubits would be impossible on a classical computer. So uh, using state-of-the-art technology, if you want to start from first principles, from these, these equations which we know to be true, and just simulate the, the, a, a single proton to derive the mass of a proton from these equations can be done. That's a cutting-edge problem right now in QCD, and it's done on the world's largest supercomputers. Um, uh, so it requires way, way more computational power to understand, let's say, a proton from first principles than something like uh, galaxies, okay? So they do, they do simulations of galaxy form form formation in the early universe where they simulate a million uh, stars at this, moving around at the same time. That is no problem. The computers they use for that are, are trivial compared to the computers they use to derive a single proton, okay? Uh, so that is a super hard problem. Uh, in quantum mechanics, um, and there are other processes uh, in nuclear physics that where it's, even with the biggest supercomputers in the world, it's not happening. Um, uh, because the, the equations simply are not in a form that we can put on a computer at all. They're just way too hard. And an example of that is anything involving real-time dynamics. So if you slam, um, uh, let's say, two uh, nuclei together, uh, as they do in heavy ion colliders at, at the LHC at CERN, for example. Um, and then there's very, very complicated dynamics when these uh, things collide and this soup kind of undergoes some very complicated physics and all kinds of stuff comes out. Um, and uh, uh, predicting the properties of the soup sort of at, at, high at the high temperatures that are reached in those collisions, uh, we cannot do from first principles. Okay, only by invoking all kinds of approximations can we hope to make predictions like that. Okay, um, so uh, so that that's problem A. Um, 
hard problem A in quantum mechanics. Uh, hard problem B is one that I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard of that, and that you've heard is hard, which is to understand quantum gravity. Uh, so, but let me start actually uh, with the classical case. So the classical, uh, classical gravity is, uh, we understand very well, and it's described by um, uh, general relativity. And let me just say a few words about general relativity that are going to be relevant uh, to the rest of the talk. Uh, so Einstein explained that the force of gravity is um, not a conventional force, that it's due to being in an accelerated reference frame. So um, uh, for example, if I drop this piece of chalk and it accelerates toward the floor, actually that's not true. The chalk did not accelerate toward the floor. It was the floor that accelerated toward the chalk. So the whole room is accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's why we feel that we're stuck uh, to the floor uh, because the room is accelerating upwards. And then if you say, how is that possible? Because you know, in Australia, they're, they, they're, us, they're accelerating the other way. And so then wouldn't we be getting further away from them? And the answer to that is that space-time itself is curved. And curvature in space-time um, uh, confuses notions of, uh, of curvature. So an example of that is, uh, for example, on, on the Earth, if you look at lines of constant latitude, um, if you want to follow a line of constant latitude, uh, let's look at these two, like on opposite sides of the equator. These, if two planes that are following these lines of constant latitude um, on the surface of the Earth will stay the same distance apart, uh, but yet the one um, uh, in the northern hemisphere has to steer to the right away from the one in the southern hemisphere, and the one in the summer, southern hemisphere is steering to the left, otherwise they will actually hit each other. And so it's the curvature of the surface of the Earth that leads to this fact that um, uh, you either, um, uh, if you follow uh, parallel, if you follow straight lines, then you end up either converging or diverging from someone else. And if you want to stay the same distance from someone else, then you have to curve yourself away or towards that uh, other person, depending on what the particular curvature is. Here it's positive curvature, so you have to steer yourself away in order to stay at the same distance. Okay, so, uh, and of course, yeah, so, um, uh, so it's the fact, in, in, in general relativity, it's, the time is important, so you have a four-dimensional space-time, and it's the curvature of that space-time that's giving rise to this feeling that there's gravity, okay, the effects that we call gravity. <clears throat> So, um, uh, and um, I should just say, I mean, this theory is uh, over 100 years old by now, and um, it's just, first of all, it's an incredibly beautiful theory in itself, mathematically, but uh, these days, there's more general relativity in the news than I've ever expected to happen in my lifetime. So the discoveries being made, I mean, all of this stuff about black holes and, and, and so on was, you know, I, I learned about it, I thought it was very beautiful, but I never really expected um, that they would observe gravitational waves in my lifetime. And now it's like a routine thing to observe gravitational waves emitted by colliding black holes. This is just unbelievable. The Event Horizon Telescope with a picture of the black hole and so on. Um, uh, so these days it's, it, it's really glorious. Um, and I'm sure Roberto will be talking about that. Uh, and, um, uh, and then, of course, the other killer app for general relativity besides black holes is, um, uh, is cosmology and, early, and uh, you know, um, the history of the universe and so on. So uh, that is all very beautiful, and uh, obviously we could talk about that for a whole day. Um, uh, but um, uh, the thing is, this is a classical theory, and so... Uh, uh, by virtue of being a classical theory, anything you would observe has a definite value within this theory. Um, so the curvature of space-time at some point is, you know, is a variable, is an observable, which has a well-defined specific value um, you know, at any given time, at any given place. Um, uh, and of course, when you, when you go to quantum, if, if you try to quantize this theory, in other words, if you try to make a quantum version of this theory, then uh, it's going to be more complicated. You're going to have uh, the uncertainty principle. And it turns out that the uncertainty principle really messes with the theory on very, very short length scales. So it's not a problem making a quantum theory of gravity 
for doing long distance physics. But if you want a quantum theory of gravity that would work at all distance scales, especially when you get down to the Planck scale, then it's very hard, OK? Um, and uh, that's not to say that we don't know anything about how to do it. Um, uh, and the best theories that we have are these string theories. Um, uh, so I'm not going to talk about string theory and um, its great successes and how it works and so on. But suffice it to say that we have these uh, excellent quantum theories of gravity. They're, they're, they're totally legit. Um, uh, and they solve the problems of these large fluctuations in the geometry of space-time at the Planck scale and so on um, in a very beautiful way. And if, you know, in, in the way it works in string theory is that instead of particles, you have little bits of string. And it's far from obvious why that would help you with anything. But it, 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 trust me, it does. Um, but um, uh, there are two um, uh, issues with string theory that I want to highlight. Actually, the first one I'm not that interested in for this talk, but I do feel some moral obligation to mention that one thing we don't know about string theory is um, uh, whether it has anything to do with our world. So does it describe quantum gravity in our world? We have um, essentially no evidence for or against this. Um, and that's an incredibly important question, which many people are working on. Um, so this has to do with the question of making experimental predictions that can be tested from string theory. Uh, <clears throat> and there's obviously a huge amount to be said about that. But um, uh, the second thing, which is uh, a, a real problem with string theory, even from a theoretical point of view, is that we kind of, at some level, don't understand why it works. Uh, it's a set of rules for doing computations. We don't know the fundamental equations. Uh, and so we can't really use it uh, to answer very, um, so we can use it to calculate certain things, but then we can't use it to answer some of the deepest questions about quantum gravity that really deeply confuse us, like um, how is it possible, what happened at the Big Bang, what happens in the singularity inside a black hole, uh, um, it, do black holes destroy information, Hawking's paradox, and so on. So if you just follow the rules of string theory, it allows you to calculate things like what happens if you send two gravitational waves and they collide and they go out, and you can, uh, that's, you, you can calculate quantum effects you know, uh, uh, for that process. But a process like a, the evaporation of a black hole, string theory has very little to say about. So, um, you see, these two problems are, are sort of, we're in opposite situations with them. This is a situation where we know the fundamental equations, but they're too hard for us to solve. This is a problem where we can solve the equations, but we don't know what equations we've just solved, right? So we have a, somebody just gave us a recipe for calculating certain things, and that recipe is awesome, and it, and it, and it works very well for calculating those things, um, but uh, then it's mute on these other interesting questions because we don't have the fundamental uh, rules that it was derived from, okay? Okay, so um, uh, these two, you know, these are basically two of the most important problems in theoretical physics in the last, um, uh, you know, 50 years or so, I would say. Um, I think I messed up my board work because I'm not going to be able to lift this one without, you can see I'm not, not much of a teacher because <laughs> I should have known. Uh, so um, yeah, the question is whether if I write at the bottom, people in the back can see. If I write down here, you can see? OK, awesome. I have the whole board. OK, so um, what I want to tell you next is that rather shockingly, these are actually very closely related. Um, and there's absolutely no reason to believe that that would be the case. They come from completely different parts of physics, um, and they're about totally different things. Uh, but um, uh, about 25 years ago, coming out of work in string theory, trying to understand black holes. So in the 90s, um, string theorists were in the situation where they, they had this, this theory that they knew worked, and they said, God damn it, we need to understand black holes. And they really spent a huge amount of time 
doing as much as they could to understand black holes using string theory and learned a, a huge amount. And one thing that came out, um, uh, on the face of it, has nothing to do with black holes, but this theory basically fell out of the investigation of string theory in black, in, uh, of black holes in string theory. And that was a total surprise. Okay, um, uh, so <clears throat> the thing that came out um, <clears throat> uh, to be a little more specific um, uh, is a relation between uh, quantum gravity, a certain type of quantum gravity, and a certain type of quantum mechanics that has a very a large amount of fluctuations, uh, very strong quantum effects. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, with large quantum effects, in other words, large fluctuations in things like the particle number, that if you have a system like that, it's equivalent to uh, quantum gravity theory. And that already sounds weird and pretty much impossible. Um, uh, but it gets weirder because actually they're not even in the same space. Uh, so if you have uh, a quantum mechanical system, for example, describing the proton or something like that, uh, in some number of dimensions, let's call it d dimensions. So I, I it should be clear as a theoretical physicist for me, and this is going to be a theme I think of Roberto's talk. For us, you know, the number of dimensions of space is a variable. It's not just God given. So we 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 play with it in our theories. Okay, uh, the number of dimensions of space, d dimensions of space, uh, and then there's also plus time. Uh, the number of dimensions of space in this one uh, is d plus 1. And I'm going to say how that's possible. Uh, now, um, I gave myself more space here because I need to add more caveats. So it's not just always true. Uh, and it, it, it works best in, in certain limits. And this is so. Um, uh, I assume you guys are familiar with the, the um, parable of the spherical cow. Uh, so um, you want me to tell you that? OK, all right. So a farmer is having trouble um, uh, you know, his cow, milking his cow. His cow doesn't, is not giving enough milk. And, so, um, and for some reason, the veterinarian can't help. And so he calls his neighbor, who's a theoretical physicist, and the, the theoretical physicist, this is a fascinating problem. You know, I'm really interested in this problem. So um, uh, let, let's see if we can make some progress on the problem. So um, first of all, consider a spherical cow uh, radiating milk uniformly in all directions. Uh, so this is what we do. We take a problem and we make, you know, impose spherical symmetry and so on. So this, um, uh, these theories have um, are not exactly like QCD. They have extra symmetries, um, something fancy called supersymmetry and whatever, um, uh, that help us understand what's going on. And we don't really understand to what extent those kind of spherical cow approximations are necessary or just have to do with how well we can analyze this, the system. This is one of the most important questions. But the cases where we do feel like we understand the system are the ones that have a huge amount of extra symmetry. So, uh, they're not necessarily realistic problems, although they approximate realistic problems. And the other thing that's interesting is that the, it, it simplifies um, uh, when you have a large number, and this is a bit paradox paradoxical, but a large number of uh, particle species or fields. Uh, so, um, uh, so, for example, in QCD, the forces that hold the quarks together are uh, similar. They're, they're not electromagnetic forces, but they're similar to electromagnetic. There's, a, there's electric fields and magnetic fields, but instead of just one kind, there's actually eight different, they're called colors of electric field and eight different colors of magnetic field, and they're all interacting with each other. And um, 
what we do is we take the number of colors and make it dial it to be very large and the larger so then you have more and more and more particles and you would think this is crazy this is just going to make it impossible to analyze but it's the opposite because when you have a lot of different particles then you can just average over them and then you get what's called a collective description the same as uh, in thermodynamics you don't worry anymore about every individual molecule you just say okay well what's the average temperature the average pressure maybe you have air flows or something like that and so then you get this much simpler description so here by tuning up the amount of complication you get a simpler description because you get to average over all of the details that you don't care about okay and that simpler description is general relativity okay uh, and so it's 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 quantum gravity but um, here uh, in um, uh, in a classical limit so um, meaning that uh, it's classical GR plus small quantum corrections that we that are controlled that we know how to deal with okay so it's not a full-on like trying to understand what's going on at the Planck scale or something like that this is this is a theory that we can legit calculate with okay um, uh, but it has it has a couple weird features one is that it has an extra dimension uh, and uh, the other is that um, it has a negative cosmological constant. Uh, so uh, this is the, so the cosmological constant is basically the, the density of energy of the vacuum in general relativity. And it, you know, one of the Nobel Prize winning discoveries of the 1990s is that in our universe, the galaxies are accelerating away from each other. And the reason they're accelerating away from each other is because we have a positive cosmological, it's probably because we have a positive cosmological constant in our universe. And these toy model universes here have a negative cosmological constant. And that means that this, the stuff in them has a tendency to, to, um, uh, to contract even more than their gravitational inter attraction makes them uh, contract. So if you have a universe with a negative cosmological constant, instead of the galaxies accelerating away from each other, they accelerate towards each other and the whole space collapses into what's called a big crunch, the opposite of a big bang in a, in a, in a short amount of time, okay? So it's a good thing that we don't have a negative cosmological constant in our universe. Um, but uh, you can eliminate that problem of the contraction by uh, forcing the space open and giving it a boundary. So you tie the space, the, uh, so you basically make the universe, unlike in our universe, as far as we know, we don't have a boundary. You give it a boundary and you keep it from collapsing. Um, and so you get a space which is like a drum head uh, where this is, the, this is the interior and the space is tied down on the exterior, okay, like a like a sheet, like a membrane tied on a on the edge of a drum head, and it's under tension that way. Okay, it's wanting to it's wanting to collapse, but you've prevented it from doing so. Okay, and so it has some particular geometry, and this is where the fact that in general relativity you have curved space time comes in. Okay, so this I drew a disk. Yeah, let's. So my drawing skills are pretty limited, as you can probably guess already. Um, so, um, uh, the simplest case would be um, uh, where this D is 1, and so D plus 1 is 2, so we have a two-dimensional space. And um, if, you, if you've studied any kind of like hyperbolic geometry, what's in here is, is, is a hyperbolic plane. And that just means it's the opposite of the sphere, it has negative curvature. Um, let me attempt a 3D drawing. And here I'm, I'm not going to do the boundary as a sphere. I'm going to do the boundary just as a sheet. So this is d equals 1. This is d equals 2. And um, uh, so I have this boundary. And you can think that actually this is part of a large sphere, but I'm just drawing like a little part of it, OK? Again, this is due to limitations in my drawing ability. So, but as, so now we have this extra dimension. Um, and the space con contracts uh, as you go down in the dimension. Does that actually make any sense? Okay, so, uh, so we have this extra dimension where if you just look at the size, at sizes of things as you go down, it contracts, okay? 
Uh, and um, uh, so this is, again, a, basically a hyper, this is a hyperbolic plane. This is a hyperbolic space, three-dimensional hyperbolic space. And it has this boundary, and the boundary is very, very important. Okay, but what's, it, it, I'll say what it is in a second, but what's going on inside is you have general relativity, which means you have, you know, you can have gravitational waves, stars and planets and black holes and stuff here that are moving around, okay? And there's a gravitational potential which tends to pull things away from the boundary. So here, if you have a particle and you send it out, it will turn around and come back towards the middle, okay? There's just this gravitational pull towards the center. Um, and by the way, this, I mean, it's, I don't know even whether to say it, but anyway, this kind of space-time has a name um, which is not going to be useful for, for what I say, but I, somehow I just feel this obligation to say what the name is. It's called anti-de Sitter space. Uh, it's the opposite of de Sitter space-time, which was discovered by, by de Sitter in the 20s uh, and which describes this accelerated expansion. So anti because it's the opposite, um, uh, it, because it has a negative cosmological constant. Okay, so I've been going on and on about the boundary. That's because the boundary is, in some sense, the place where this, the boundary is d-dimensional, right? And it's the place where the quantum mechanics lives. So the particles, for example, in, in some kind of version of QCD, where you have quarks and gluons, they are living here, okay? So the quantum mechanics lives on the boundary. And um, uh, so you have, on the one hand, you have general relativity plus small quantum corrections um, in this, what I'll call the bulk. Here are three dimensions. And on the other hand, you have quantum mechanics in two dimensions, let's say. And we know examples where D ranges from zero up to, I guess, six. Um, and there may be others. So again, it's sort of a variable we can tune, but let's just Take these two examples, because, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Right, so it's, it's very important when you have a negative cosmological constant that to avoid this collapse, you have a boundary. And um, uh, it's, it's like having the universe in a box, okay? And uh, so, um, uh, and, um, uh, so, if, if you didn't have this, then whatever space you had here would just make a crunch, okay, if you followed the equations of general relativity. Um, so this, it, you can almost see that the space is trying to contract here, and it's being prevented from doing so by a boundary condition that you put on this plane, okay? Is that equivalent to the outside of your circle? Yeah, exactly. So this is like... This is, think of this as actually being part of a big sphere, okay? And I've just drawn one little piece of it. So it's not that there's, there's no edge here, okay? It's just this is part of a plane, and um, maybe it's part of a big sphere, okay? Um, so when I say boundary, I mean this, this plane, which could be an infinite plane, or it could be part of a big sphere, okay? Yeah, thank you for interrupting me, yeah. No, you, you, you get a choice. You get a choice. I mean, there's various ways to play this game and so on. I'm just trying to give you a couple of simple options. Um, right. Um, yeah, great, great question. Any other questions? Yeah. I've got to just ask, I just cannot, so D equals 2 is the quantum mechanics is on the surface of the sphere and the yes. relativity is in the interior yes. of the sphere? Yes, correct. Correct. So in this case, it's like the general relativity is like in our universe, which is which has three. Last time I checked, three dimensions of space and one of time. So this is like our universe, except for the negative cosmological constant, and the quantum mechanics is living on a plane. Okay. Um, so the particles. Well, it's. Um, uh, Right, right. So there, there's another case where the quantum mechanics is in three dimensions, and then there's four dimensions of space in the general relativity. Um, so, uh, so it's yeah, it it it's never the case that both of these are realistic, 
In fact, it's not the case that either one is a realistic description of some part of our universe. These are all kind of toy models. That being said, there are many interesting problems in quantum mechanics that are two-dimensional or even one-dimensional. Um, and an example is uh, where this kind of technique is applied is certain exotic superconducting materials where actually all of the action is happening on certain planes and the third direction is just kind of going along for the ride. All of the interesting, very hard physics is happening on planes and so you can give a, a very good two-dimensional quantum mechanics description of that. Um, and then you can use this kind of um, relationship to study these kind of uh, exotic superconductors. So there are many real world examples where you have two dimensions or one dimensional quantum mechanics going on. I don't know of anywhere you have four dimensional or five dimensional quantum mechanics going on, but who knows. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the quantum mechanics happens on the shell yeah. and the rest of the gravity is in the Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, when I give colloquia, I, I show a picture of a snow globe, you know, and all the, the stuff going on in the inside. And Okay, but there's one thing that I want to emphasize um, uh, that is very important and very difficult to get your head around, which is that what we don't have here is a system with general relativity and quantum mechanics. That is not true. We have a system and two different descriptions of the same system. One description is general relativity. The other description is quantum mechanics. They are two sides of the same coin. The general relativity is not interacting with the quantum mechanics. The general relativity is the quantum mechanics. Okay, so that is kind of the one problem with this kind of picture that you draw is that you start to think that you have these two, oh, it's general relativity with quantum mechanics on the boundary. No, it's general relativity, or you could say it differently, it's quantum mechanics, okay? Any other questions? Okay, but you can see how unbelievably powerful a relation like this can be because now we can compute stuff that we cannot compute in this description using this description. And people do that for studying things like these heavy ion collisions, which are described here as collisions of shock waves in general relativity that form black holes. Okay, so you can describe in a semi-quantitative way because it's not, it's, you're making approximations along the way, but you can understand qualitatively the physics of collisions of nuclei by simulating uh, black holes in a space with an extra dimension, five dimensional black holes. That is totally insane to me, okay? And you get out numbers that you can compare to experiment, and so on, okay? Uh, you can study exotic superconductors where the physics is very difficult because the electrons are very strongly interacting with the ion lattice and you can't solve the quantum mechanics equations and you model them as uh, general relativity in three dimensions and you get out the um, uh, equations that you, you get out numbers that you can compare to experiment. Uh, one thing that's very interesting here that, um, is that if you study the physics of what happens when you heat up this quantum mechanical system, that is reflected here by having black holes here. Okay, so the physics of black holes is directly related to thermal physics, high temperature physics in the quantum mechanics. On the other hand, you can turn this around and use what you know fundamentally about properties of theories like this to answer con difficult conceptual questions about quantum gravity, like whether black holes lose information when they evaporate. Uh, now, we haven't been able to do it to answer some of the most interesting, so by the way, the answer to that question is no, okay? And we know that because of this. Uh, what we still don't understand quite is how that information gets out. So there's a whole, I could do a whole thing on black hole information and so on, but, it, but that's the kind of question that we can start to answer using the, this connection. What we haven't been successful yet in answering is questions about cosmology because we're kind of stuck with this negative cosmological constant which gets rid of the 
black big bang singularity and stuff like that that we don't understand so that's still definitely an unexplored frontier okay but it's been unbelievably fruitful in both directions these kind of things this 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 relation okay any question before i go to part three Um, right, yeah, there, um, uh, so um, I should say, so there, there are many different flavors of string theory, and the flavors of string theory that appear in these constructions definitely are not reflecting our world because they have the wrong cosmological constant. Uh, the question is whether there exist other flavors that have the right kind of cosmological constant and particle physics that we see in our world. Right. Yeah. I see the word holography on the board. Oh, thank you. So, thank you, Maggie. Good. Uh, yes. Great. So um, there's a good way to think about this, um, which is that the real system. This, uh, what I'm about to say is a little controversial. Not everyone. Not every string theorist would agree with this, but let me just throw it out there. There's a way of thinking about it where where this side is the real system, and this side is a useful description of it. And uh, in that description, you see that the quantum mechanics has grown an extra dimension, and it's like a hologram. Okay, so in a hologram, the real object in a hologram is a, is a piece of film. Okay, but when you look at it, it appears to have a third dimension and be like an apple or whatever it is, a uh, three-dimensional object. And so that's why we use the word holography to describe this situation where um, the system has, of its own accord, grown, an ex grown the illusion of an extra dimension. Okay, so we refer, we refer to these as, hol as holography, this kind of connection. Great, yeah. Um. I, my own view is, uh, yeah, I, the, the reason, and th this may be a bad reason, but the reason is that we know the fundamental equations for this side of it, and we don't know the fundamental equations for this side of it. So one point of view you can take is that there aren't any, or to say it a different way, the fundamental equations for this side are the ones for this side. It doesn't have an independent fundamental description. This is highly controversial within our field, this question of whether this side has an independent fundamental description or whether you have to say there's only one, and that's this one, and this is just a convenient illusion. Okay? Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know if my question even makes sense, but so is the edge of the universe a quantum mechanical surface or a, a classical Oh, that's a great that's a great question. Right. So, um, uh, right, the quantum mechanical system, this side, does not have gravity, and that means that it does not have a fluctuating uh, space time. It has a fixed geometry of space time, which could just be regular flat space, you know, or it could be a sphere, but it's fixed. Okay. And so the geometry of the boundary is not fluctuating. It is not dynamical. It is just tied down. Whatever you say it is, it is. No waves. And the waves, so it's like the waves in a swimming pool, they don't make the edge of the swimming pool rock back and forth, right? So waves, there are waves in here and they just reflect off. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, how much time do I have, if any? Oh, awesome. Okay. Okay, so then I will have time to talk about part three. Um, and I'm going to want this picture. Um, so one word I haven't used so far is entanglement. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, uncertainty principle is great, but entanglement is really one of the most cool and exciting aspects of quantum mechanics, as John uh, explained to us very well. And you get violations of Bell inequalities and all of these weird things in quantum computers depend crucially on entanglement and so on. So uh, if I say that this is quantum mechanics, uh, show me the entanglement, right? And um, so indeed, 
you know, the different parts of uh, this quantum mechanical system are highly entangled with each other. So even inside a proton, the different parts are highly entangled with each other. Um, but boy, it's really, really hard to analyze that quantitatively to say how entangled they are with each other. So let me, let me just mention first that if you take some quantum mechanical system, uh, so John alluded to the idea of a bell pair, um, uh, and you, you look at the two parts of it. So if you, if you take a quantum mechanical system that has two parts, then you want to quantify the amount of entanglement. And the amount of entanglement can basically be quantified by how many, uh, effectively how many bell pairs worth of entanglement you have in there. Okay, so if I have some big quantum mechanical system with two parts, they're highly entangled, and I want to say how entangled they are, I would basically say how many, effectively how many bell pairs worth of entanglement are connecting them, okay? And that can be made precise as an equation for it and so on, and it can be calculated if you know enough about your system, you can calculate how much entanglement. And I'm just going to use this symbol S um, and uh, the, the reason for using S is because this is closely related to an entropy, and so there's a very close connection actually between um, in the study of entanglement and quantum statistical mechanics and entropies and so on. But let me, let me put that aside. So let me just say S is basically um, uh, the number of bell pairs uh, worth of entanglement. Uh, between two systems. So let me, let me, so let's say I have a part of system, yeah, I'll draw a picture in a second, between A and uh, the rest of the system. Okay, so let's say I have some quantum mechanical system, could be one of these, and I, um, uh, I ask how entangled is some part of it with the rest, okay? So it could be like, how entangled is this half of the room with this half of the room, et cetera, okay? Um, and I'm gonna denote that amount S of A, okay? And um, uh, I can play the same game here. I could take part of my circle and just ask um, how entangled is this part of the circle with the rest of the circle? Or I could take some part here and ask how entangled is this disk with the rest of the plane, okay? When I'm asking that question, I, I wanna emphasize that I've made an artificial distinction between this part of the system and the rest, and that's something I can do as a theorist. It's not that, just like if I ask the question, how entangled is this part of the room with this part of the room, I have not actually built a barrier. There's no physical separation between them. It's you know, continuous, but I'm just asking the question. I could ask a different question, how entangled is this half of the room from this half of the room, et cetera. So I put some, I divide it up in some arbitrary way, and then I ask how, how much entanglement is there between those two parts, okay? Yeah. Sorry, is there a, a, a can you explain just briefly what, what a bell pair is? Okay, okay, so um, uh, a bell pair is when you have a correlation between two parts of the system. In fact, entanglement is when you have a correlation at the level of quantum mechanics between two parts of a system. So for example, you could have, um, I mean, in, 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 in physics, we, um, uh, let, let's do the coins. Um, so you have quantum coins, uh, and um, uh, if you have two quantum coins, then they could be correlated in the sense that uh, you're in a state where um, uh, either they're both heads or they're both tails. And so that's a correlation because if you measure one, you find it's heads, you know the other one is heads. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you know, John was talking about with Alice and Bob and, and so on. Um, uh, and that is the most elementary um, form of entanglement where you just have two two state systems. Each coin can either be heads or tails, that's the simplest it could be. If it was just one state, it becomes pretty uninteresting. So the, the minimum to have anything going on is two states, heads or tails, and you just have two of them. And uh, if they're perfectly correlated, 
meaning, you know, let's say both heads or both tails, uh, then that's one bell pair. Now I could have a million degrees of freedom, some complicated quarks and gluons and so on, and, you know, and, and, then, and they're in, entangled in some really complicated way, but I just want to say how much entanglement there is. And so there's kind of a unit of currency in this world, which is the bell pair, which is basically that the amount of entanglement is quantified by uh, effectively the number of bell pairs connect. Of course, they're not actual, they're not coins, of course, they're whatever they are, but um, uh, as a way of um, uh, quantifying the amount of entanglement, we use the bell pair as the elementary unit. Yes, exactly. So, so um, uh, I'll just I'll just give one e example, and maybe it'll help, and maybe it won't. But let's say you instead of two states, you had four states on one side, and four states on the other, and they were perfectly correlated. So if it was you know zero zero or one one or two two or three three, that would be equivalent to two bell pairs. Um, uh, because you can just rewrite that as having like two coins on one side, which can be, you know, head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, or tail, head. So that's four states, two coins on the other side. And so you can go, you can rewrite that thing I said in terms of two coins on one side, two coins on the other that are perfectly co correlated. And so that's two bell pairs. Okay. Yeah. Say it again, or well, yeah. I was just wondering if you have two pairs, does that mean at, at times mathematically you would consider one a plus and the other a minus, or one in the middle? Yeah, you could. Well, um, uh, yeah. I mean, you can just call. You can label them zero one. You can label them plus minus. You could label them spin up, spin down. You know, or you could label them ground state and first excited state. Right. I mean, of course, the physics here, we're, you know, at this level, we're not talking about the physics of what's actually happening. We're just sort of treating it like in, in an information-y kind of way where a bit can be 0, 1, a bit could be A and B, true or false, heads up, heads down. You know, from an information point of view, you know, these are all the same. But I, I don't know if I answered your question, so. No, you did. Okay. What are the chances? Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> Okay, any other questions before I get to the punchline? Okay, so um, uh, so there is this question, um, what is the amount of entanglement? It's a perfectly reasonable question, and in most realistic physical situations of like things you would find in nature or build in the lab or even the theorists would dream of, it's actually unbelievably hard to compute this quantity, okay, um, uh, and it's very interesting to compute this quantity because it tells you a lot about the physics of what's going on, okay. Um, it turns out there's a beautiful relation between this quantity and the geometry here, and that relation was discovered about 15 years ago by um, uh, two guys by the name of Ryu and Takeyanagi, um, and they said, uh, that this quantity is given by a certain surface area in this geometry, this curved geometry, and that there's a very simple way to say what that surface area is. It's the minimal area of a surface that is anchored on this boundary of A. So you put in a, a surface, in this case it would be a two-dimensional surface uh, that hangs down into this three-dimensional space but is tied to the boundary on the boundary of A. In this case it would be a curve that is tied, that falls in and comes back out and it's tied on the boundary. Here the boundary of A is two points, here the boundary of A is this circle. 
And it's, it's the minimal surface subject to those boundary conditions, similar to the way a soap bubble takes a minimal surface tied to some wire. And you know that if the wire is bent in some funny way, then of course the minimal surface will have to curve in some way. Now you could say, well, this, surf, this wire, the yellow thing is the wire, you know, it's on a plane. Why doesn't the minimal surface just uh, span the plane? Well, the thing is, it can do better than spanning the plane because the distances are smaller on the inside. It's trying to minimize its area. So it goes down in order to get a smaller total area. Okay, so there is some area, X, there's a cost in area because it's going down, but there's a benefit because it's, uh, because it's going down to this region where the space is smaller. And, um, and it's sort of bound, that's also why it doesn't go really far down because then it would just have this, all this extra area. So anyway, it solves this problem. This is a classical problem in geometry called the plateau problem of finding the minimal area um, uh, surface sub, you know, connected to some uh, boundary. So let me just write the equation. Um, so it's given by the area of the minimal surface in some units, this, this is dimensionless. It doesn't have units. Uh, so, but this is an area or a length. I'll, I'll use the word area just to be definite so I don't have to keep writing area or length. So um, uh, we need some, something with units of area and the answer is the Planck area. And the Planck area is given um, uh, by uh, Newton's constant times H bar and then the, the coefficient is actually known. There's a one quarter there. Um, uh, and this um, formula uh, is very directly related to black hole entropy. So black holes, a black hole has an entropy which is given by the same formula, but instead of the area of the minimal surface, it's the area of the event horizon. Okay, and they were inspired by that formula. That formula was discovered in the 70s by Bekenstein and Hawking. They were inspired by that formula to say the amount of entanglement, because again, there's this relation between entanglement and entropy, to say the amount of entanglement is given by this formula. This is an, un, first of all, it's an unbelievably beautiful formula because of the simplicity of the right-hand side, but it's also incredibly powerful. It's taught us a huge amount about entanglement, uh, not just in gravity, but also in this type of, of um, quantum mechanics system. And, um, uh, and, and um, uh, it has all of these beautiful properties. So it, 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 it builds into it. So John was talking about quantum information science and this formula and its generalization. So we've been studying this for 15 years and there's way, way more to say about it and um, uh, all kinds of generalizations and applications and so on. But the punchline I, I, I want to say is that this formula tells us that actually quantum information science and in particular entanglement is built into the geometry of space, okay? In very subtle ways so that um, uh, there are, for example, there are theorems about this, the left-hand side that, are, that encapsulate very subtle properties of entanglement that you can turn into theorems about minimal surfaces. So, there, so you, you see, we started with the premise that it's hard to quantize gravity, but now it seems that it's, it's impossible not to uh, because um, uh, general relativity has built into it quantum mechanics in this totally unexpected way, okay? So, um, uh, so, um, uh, <clears throat> so let me write, the slogan, so we have these two slogans. So, um, yeah. So first of all, entanglement uh, is built into uh, space-time geometry. That is a fact that we know from this, but it leads to the question, uh, which is a slogan and um, sort of a research direction. Um, uh, if can I turn this around? Can I view the entanglement as the thing? So uh, is space-time geometry built out of entanglement? 
should I view the entanglement as the fundamental thing and everything will be derived from it? And I'll say that, for example, you can take this formula and from it you can derive the Einstein equation which, which uh, governs space-time geometry in general relativity. Okay, I'll leave it there, thank you. Questions? All questions have been answered, oh no. <laughs> So just to follow up on your last statement, you can take that equation at the bottom and derive the Einstein equations in a space that we live in or in no. a negatively curved space? No, in this this baby. Yeah, so we, we don't know how to play this game in our universe, but I don't think it's so unreasonable to guess. I mean, this seems like such a fundamental thing that it would, even though we only you know, really understand it in, in a precise sense in this kind of toy, spherical cow toy model um, uh, setting, it's very hard to believe that it's not deeper than that and that something like it wouldn't apply in our universe. So that the area of some minimal surface cutting through this room, my personal opinion is, is it must equal the entanglement. I just can't tell you what it's the entanglement of. So that's one detail that's missing. <laughs> yeah. But it's a great question. Um, I had a question about um, the entropy uh, and entanglement. Yeah. And um, perhaps it's my own failure in understanding my stat met, but I always had a hard time with the um, uh, the entropy is as information. Mm -hmm. um, how is that entropy of information um, related exactly to entanglement? Are you saying that uh, there's a, a communication or, or a something, you know, what, it, what is right. it? Right. <laughs> great, great. I love this. So um, uh, you're giving me the chance to fill in the something that I wanted to say but didn't have time to. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, what is the connection between entanglement and entropy? Let me first say a few words about the meaning of the word, uh, the meanings of the word entropy. Entropy is a very subtle and slippery concept that um, uh, a lot of people misunderstand. Um, uh, so, of course, there's thermodynamic entropy, which is the kind that Clausius and so on originally came up with the concept. They didn't know what it meant. They just, it was just a quantity that obeyed the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, and so on. And then it was understood later by Boltzmann and Planck that entropy is a measure of ignorance. So that if, you know, the, the whole difference between a microscopic description of a system, such as gas in a box, and a macroscopic description, such as saying this is temperature, um, uh, volume, pressure, and so on, is that the macroscopic description is missing all the detailed information about exactly where all the molecules are and how they're moving around. And so what you do, what Planck said in an equation that later got Boltzmann's name on it somehow, uh, is that um, the entropy is the logarithm of the number of microscopic states consistent with a given macroscopic state. So, um, and in fact, that equation is even on Boltzmann's tombstone, right? Um, uh, although it's uh, it's not as good a story as it sounds like. I, I always, when I first heard that, I was like, oh, wow, he must have written in his will, you know, please put this. Somebody else wrote it, right? Yeah, it's like 20 years later, somebody else put it on. And anyway, it wasn't his equation, it was Planck's, but whatever. Um, uh, so, um, and Boltzmann's constant was first written down by Planck, but anyway. So, uh, uh, so in that view of things, um, entropy is your fault, okay? You don't know... Uh, the details, therefore, there's entropy, right? It's all about you. Uh, if you had a different state of knowledge, the entropy would have been different, right? Um, and that's really weird in physics for there to be equations that contain uh, something that depends on your state of knowledge um, that are supposed to be these fundamental equations. Okay, in quantum mechanics, the view is different because um, entropy can arise from entanglement as follows. Uh, if you're in one of these correlated entangled states, like a bell pair, either they're both heads or they're both tails, 
and now you only have access. So first of all, a very important thing is that is a definite state. It has no entropy. It is one state, right? There's even though, so there's a difference between entropy and uncertainty. Uh, that is a definite state, that bell pair state, it has no entropy. However, if you throw away one of the coins, this coin that's left is 50% chance of being heads, 50% chance of tails. You see entropy came in, right? It's now a probability distribution and it has entropy. And so um, uh, entanglement leads to uncertainty, leads to entropy via the uncertainty principle, basically. Uh, via the fact that observables like whether the thing is heads up or is heads or tails has some uncertainty, that's given by Heisenberg. Um, but uh, that uncertainty then, that, that doesn't necessarily, that uncertainty by itself doesn't mean that you have entropy. It doesn't mean that you're in a definite state, uh, that you're in an indefinite state. But if you throw away part of the system and you have entanglement, what's left does have entropy. Right, and so in some sense, any entropy you have of a box of gas can be thought of as due to, not having to do with your ignorance, but having to do with the fact that that box of gas is entangled with the rest of the universe. Any box of gas is necessarily highly entangled with the rest of the universe, and so you can assign that entropy to entanglement. So more entropy more is more entanglement. Yeah, so you can go back and, in fact, at some level, entropy is entanglement, and entanglement is entropy. Um, uh, you can take, if there's entanglement, that, Im that implies entropy for, part of, you know, for one part of the system, and vice versa. If you have entropy for part of a system, you can say, well, that entropy is due to entanglement with the, with, you know, the rest of the universe. So you can just, they're actually completely equivalent. So in that sense, quantum statistical mechanics is, is, is completely different at its foundations from classical statistical mechanics. Thank you. Well, we're, we're running a little bit behind, so I'll take one more question and then we'll have another hour and a half over lunch. Too. How is a Bose-Einstein condensate related to what you just said? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Why do you? Because they're all, they're all together. And yeah. Act as one. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, in fact, so Bose-Einstein condensates came up, I guess, in John's talk in a superconducting qubit, the electrons are basically in some kind of co collective state. So that's when you have a large number of particles. Normally, they're, you know, each, they're kind of doing their own thing, and, um, uh, and uh, so, um, uh, but in, in, in something, in a state like a Bose-Einstein condensate, which also happens in a superconductor, um, they all just go into one same joint wave function. Uh, and so then they're basically all in one giant entangled state. Those are the cases that are actually relatively easy to describe. So superconductors where what's going on is the electrons are in a big Bose-Einstein condensate are the ones that we understand pretty well. Those are called conventional superconductors. And the ones where something else is happening that we don't understand are the unconventional ones. And those are the ones that people model using this, um, this kind of technique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, sorry, I have to, well, is it very short? Okay. <laughs> is, is, does classical projective geometry fit anywhere in, this, in these models? Um, uh, yeah, although it's, it's a bit, I mean, it's projective geometry in higher dimensions with indefinite signature. I mean, there is a mathematical connection between this and, and, and classical projective geometry, which is sometimes useful, but it's, it's a little indirect, yeah. Okay, so I'm sure there are many more great questions, but uh, we'll save them for lunch, so let's thank Matt again. Thank you.